as a 20 year old, I came to Borneo for the first time. I had a dream that Borneo would be the richest rainforest on the planet, that it would be colorful, teeming with life, extraordinary in all ways. And it was true. It was absolutely all of that. But what I didn't know as much about was the incredible logging. It was just overwhelming. It made me really think that if nothing else, if my job will never make a difference, I cannot live with not trying. I became determined to follow the process and see if a picture and a film can make a difference. <laughs> what is important is to try to affect change. And I repeat that like a mantra because I think that is what pictures can do. Since then, I've been to Borneo 35, maybe even 40 times, and I've spent combined four years, I would say, inside the forest. I've just started. I've only worked for 23 years. I have at least 23 to go, so I'm just starting out. So what I'm about to show you are two chapters. The dream is chapter one. It's what Borneo meant to me and still means to me when it comes to the Borneo that I love, that, I, that has become a second home for me. And chapter two uh, will tell you what it looks like <laughs> to a greater extent than the dream. This is one of the most spectacular places. It's not a place where you can bump into colorful life all the time. It's not like Eastern Africa where you see an incredible abundance of biomass. This is a place of small miracles. And it's one of the most incredible places when you listen and feel the forest. This is a place where lots of adventures, explorers like Alfred Russell Wallace, and the disciples of Linnaeus ventured in to find new territory, new species. And it's still the place to go if you venture into these unknown territories in Borneo, where you would find in each expedition a couple of new species at least. It's one of the places where you can sit in the middle of this dipterocarp forest and use the trick that you can use in any environment to sit still and you let the forest move around you. From the beginning, it's like walking into a cathedral, some of the lowland rainforest. I'm not a religious person, let me begin by saying that. But it is so religious in a way, it's so soul-cleansing. It's like a retreat to be in this place. Usually I go to Borneo with two, three hundred kilos of equipment minimum, at least one durable assistant. <laughs> but uh, actually the longest expedition was in 95, 96, and it, that resulted in a cover story for the magazine. And that was 14 months in the making with 1.5 metric ton of equipment. Well, this is part of the logistical nightmare of being a photographer working in places like Borneo. We had two boats for this expedition. This trunk here, this is a box. This is a C-cam underwater housing for a film camera that we used to try to visualize the hidden realm inside the waterways and creeks and rivers in Borneo. So we brought underwater housings for a Super 16 camera, heavy and very, very expensive, I remember that. And we had, you know, every scuba diving thing we needed to, that we carried out into the forest to be able to dive in the waterways. I think we used about 12 seconds of it in the film. And then my wife, she's more, she's, uh, you know, more economically oriented. She said, Matthias, is this very smart? <laughs> no, possibly not. I've only crashed maybe two or three cameras over the years and a few flash units that go up in smoke. Have you ever experienced that when, when a flash all of a sudden says poof and you have this little cloud of smoke coming out? It's very disappointing. 
And then we have the leeches. This is normal, this is every day, especially when it's raining, and it's raining every day. <laughs> Over the years, I have tried to concentrate on this, on the biodiversity, the incredible diversity of Borneo. And I've tried to show this in a positive way, and I have lectured so many times about it. I've, I've made books, films, articles, all the time, focusing on things that I love, things that are so interesting. And some things that I've photographed doesn't have a name even, or they're new species, or scientists are not sure what it is that I have photographed. This is a lizard, that, that we know. <laughs> when you talk about the environment, you talk about climate change, you talk about the loss of biodiversity, you, you talk about pandemics, or you talk about just any of the big issues it's hard for especially young people to relate to. It's hard for all of us to relate to, really. What is it? What, what, what does it have to do with me? So what I have tried to do in Borneo, for example, is to find ambassadors that people possibly can relate to, or if not relate to, at least be interested in, as a ticket of an understanding. What we care about, what we feel strongly for, we want to keep and cherish, know more about. So all of these things... What was, that was the reason for me going to Borneo again and again and again. The challenge to find the pygmy elephant. Here is a picture where you can actually see my wife. That's Monica. She's not only my wife, she's also my, my partner in crimes here. She, in crime. she is uh, also uh, a photographer and, uh, and pro film producer. And this is me. And this is a day at work. And we really like the uh, view from our office. <laughs> this is before we had kids. Now we have two boys, so now we only climb to this level. <laughs> this is lunchtime. The husband and wife teams, about 210 feet up in a fig tree. Well, it's actually a fig that has sort of encapsulated a big dipterocarp tree. And this is another blind. This is me, about uh, 150 feet up in a tree, camouflaged with camouflage nets, tarps, and waiting for something to come by. Usually strategically positioned in front of trees that will fruit eventually. Not, you know, if you, buy, if you build the blind when it's fruiting, it's too late. So you have to build before the fruit ripens, otherwise, Birds and animals of all sorts will be uh, possibly uh, afraid of you while you build your blind. So you have to calculate on building it a few weeks before the fruits are ready to eat. And then, then it might work. Might. And then you can wait for three and a half weeks to get a picture of a rhinoceros hornbill with a fig fruit in its beak. Or you can get the whip snake. And this is my favorite. I love this snake. What it does in every forward motion, it, it, it imitates the, I should say, the movement of a windstruck liana. So it will go like this, just very carefully. And if you have this lizard here, it will go like this, and then bang, it will take it. It's, very, it's a very smart strategy. So I do the same thing when, when coming close to the snake. This is the largest poisonous snake in the world. This is in Danum Valley in Borneo, one of my favorite spots. And I'll show you how big this snake is. Two. It's about this long. It's nice, isn't it? Nice and big. <laughs> you know, and when it stands up with its hood flared, it's my size. Because it can raise one third of its body length. And here I am crawling up to this snake, and I am happy because I have found it, finally. And you can see that this is me and the camera, and I have a lot of debris in, in the way, but which, which I like. I like pictures to be, as you can see, you always have some brands sticking in. I sort of like that grittiness about photography. And my assistant, Lars Magnus, he crawls around very, very carefully. 
He's got cords and he's got flashes and he's got an extra camera and he takes this behind the scenes shot. But the snake didn't really like that. So the snake opened up like this, stood up a little bit, and then you can see my leg here perhaps and my blue sock and a shoe behind the tree. Can you see that? It went straight, you know, just past me and went into a small creek. And I said to Los Magnus, God, we, we can't miss this chance. This is so amazing that we can, that we can get this snake. You know, it's, it's, this is one of the most elusive and hard snakes to photograph in the world. So he understood the pressure and I understood the pressure. But instead of running after the snake, which, you know, might be a thing to do. I don't know what you would do. But I didn't run after the snake because what happens if you do, it will just be stressed. It will swing faster and it might even turn on you and try to strike you. It would just get stressed. So what I did is that I ran around it and I put myself in the position where I would sort of intercept the snake and have the snake swim towards me in the water. So I could take this picture. And at that time I felt, now this is divine. This is super. I, I remember the, exactly this shot. When, when I took this shot, it was like, this saved the day and the month and the year. It was, I was so happy. It's not a phenomenal picture, but given that this is such a very, very reclusive and hard snake to photograph, I was so happy. But then it saw me again. Lars Magnus came after with all the gear, and the snake saw me. And elipids, or, or these, this kind of snakes, they are very very active. Have you ever thought that when you look at snakes, like rattlesnakes, or you look at even, you know, crocodiles or sharks, you can't really see what they're thinking, if they think. They're just pretty blank. Not much happens. Nothing. But not this guy. He looks at you and he evaluates what you're going to do. He slides back and forth like this, and you can see that it's active. He's active evaluating your every moment and movement, which is very, very cool. So anyway, he saw me, and it put itself so, so, sort of in a ceasefire position right in front of me. Lars Magnus came, uh, uh, and he, he got up, caught up with us, and he took this picture. So you see the snake is sort of lying there. Aha, uh -huh, there are two of you guys again. I don't know if I like this. And I'm there, I'm taking pictures, and Lars Magnus takes this behind the scenes picture. Then all of a sudden, the snake just feels that, no, I'm sick of you guys, I don't want you. And I want to pass you, because we were sort of blocking the route downstream a bit. So what it did was that it, it stood up a little bit, not all the way up, but maybe to a few feet up like this, opened its mouth, and started to hiss. Very strange. And I stood up. You might have done too. And then I backed into the water, the, st the stream behind me, with the camera as sort of a shield in front of my legs, with a wide angle and a flash on the camera to take this picture. And to me, the relevance of taking pictures of silver leaf monkeys pygmy elephants, of the trees, the flowers, is that they become ambassadors. Even though it's a few years ago I took this picture, I still get mails every week at least about this photograph. This is hard to beat. And this is a bearded pig and a female on top of that. Look at the snout. And this is uh, an indicator species in Borneo. They are so... Um, vulnerable to change. And what is happening right now is that the ecosystem is like a house of cards where we have pulled out too many cards, so the system collapses. So bearded pigs are not as common these days. And this is another snake that I love. This is a pit viper that I photographed quite recently. I don't know if you guys like snakes, but there's something about snakes that is, they're so misunderstood, I think. And then we have orangutans. I've spent four and a half months in the trees just working with orangutans, trying to get footage and film. 
These are one of the animals that suffer the most. And I'll come back to that. <laughs> yeah, the man of the forest, Urang Utang. And they're very intelligent. They have this enormous memory, especially for when it comes to fruiting trees and where to find them. And they make reconnaissance trips to different trees so they know exactly that, well, three years from now, this durian tree will fruit. Uh, so some scientists think that they actually know and can have this sense of both timing and place, which is uh, quite phenomenal. Now this is chapter two, the reality. Because the dream is not there anymore. That is what you just have seen. And to me, this is the Borneo that I love. And that has become a second home. But this is not what it looks like in most places these days. This is what it looks like. This is the Borneo that I went to in 1988. And this is the Borneo that I've worked in so much. And the strangest thing is that as a photographer, you're out there to try to show the realms, the encapsulated realms that are heaven-like. But to go, come to those places, you travel through purgatory. You travel through hell to find encapsulated heavens. So in this story, now published in the November issue of National Geographic magazine, we turned the coin and we said, let's focus on what's really happening to Borneo. And this is what it looks like. And to me, this is like a very, very nasty nightmare. This is like something out of Lord of the Rings. You know, it can't be true. But this is what it looks like in so many areas. And it's quite depressing, of course. This is the third largest island in the world. It used to be covered with dense rainforest, peat swamp forest. But at this rate that it has been leveled now since the 70s, it's one of the worst ecological disasters in history. And this, to me, looks like something came from some other planet and just dropped and spread like cancer. But this is terracing for oil palm. And I'm not, you know, this kind of environmentalist, fundamentalist that will say, save everything, our species is, is the cancer, let's, you know, stop evolving, stop using nature. I'm not that naive at all. I have the references working in 80 different countries during these 23 years, and I, I know we're six and a half billion people on the planet. But the thing is, we have to use nature sustainably. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's what we need to do. This is the um, Bakun Dam in Borneo. This is an hydroelectric dam that is built in the middle of one of the richest ecological hotspots in Malaysia. And the pilot was so afraid of flying over this area, so he said, we can only take one turn because if they see it's me, I will be out of a job. And I won't be able to send my kids. He wanted to send his daughter to Japan to study. He said, that I can forget about it. So we have to just make one round around this Bakun Dam. We couldn't have any guides or interpreters because nobody wanted to take the risk to join us. Because there's so much corruption in some of the places we worked, in most of the places we worked, unfortunately. So, for example, one of our drivers said that, well, they know where I live. So they ca I can't be seen with you. So we had to jump out of the cars and walk into the night or into the logging concessions and then just mix and blend and try to be socially <laughs> sort of uh, uh, be become accepted by, by these wonderful people. I mean, the workers are great. It's just that they are nervous that their bosses will then see us together. So we had to hide every time they recommended that we'd hide. The thing is, we have a tendency to think that we cannot personally, as individuals, make a difference. I meet that quite frequently, that people feel that it's up to somebody else. What, what I feel is that 
when I see this, when I get to get all of this knowledge, <laughs> the references that I get from this, I feel that that is definitely wrong. I think we can all make a difference. The only thing that can save places like Borneo, I think, is that we can make the people that live there. We have to give them a better future, a more sustainable future. We have to try to give them alternatives that are good, that they can prosper, they can live in a good way, in a sustainable way, without completely massacring their, their uh, nature. And by consuming the right things, by making the right everyday choices, by using your voice, our voices, in a democratic process, if you may, we can really make a difference. These workers are Indonesian workers. About one million workers came to Borneo to find a new way of life, to have a good job. But what happens now is that they have logged almost everything in southern Kalimantan, which means that there is not a future for a lot of people. Safeguarding a natural realm is also safeguarding people's futures. We have to make sure we use nature and not misuse nature. So this story has it is possibly the, the toughest I've done, and not logistically, um, not when it comes to all the equipment, not staying in blinds and hides for, for a long, long, long time, but to be accepted by the workers and emotionally to be able to withstand really working, not just traveling through hell to find pieces of heaven, but to work in hell. And from this point, Point, I really, in this moment, I really appreciate my colleagues that work in worn, torn places, photojournalists that work in, with the, with, from one catastrophe to another. To me, this was as close as I've never ever been to that part and that kind of photography. The thing is, I think one of the greatest things that can happen to Borneo is that you log the forest. And then you have the forest that will come, the forest will come back and regrow. And you will, in that way, save a tremendous biodiversity. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And then you will harvest it again, and it will regrow, and you will harvest it again, and it will regrow. And you will, bit by bit, lose biodiversity. You will. But you will still have an incredible biodiversity compared to if you burn it and plant a monocrop, because that is the alternative. So in order for this little family to have a life, to have a good life, we have to determine, and these countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, needs to determine what to use and how to use it and what to leave for other industries such as tourism, ecotourism, pharmacology, medicine. This is an interesting picture. It's not a good picture, but it's an interesting picture. This guy is, in broad daylight, taking out Bornean ironwood out of a national park in Indonesia called Gunung Palung. The ironwood is so heavy, the density is so high, so it will sink immediately like lead. So if you put it in water, it just drops to the bottom. It's so, the quality of it is incredible. It's called bellion. So what they need to do is to, to get it out, they have to float it out with other timber. This is obviously illegal. 30% <laughs> of this national park has been logged illegally due to corruption. And the thing is, as soon as we go to a, to a hardware store or a furniture place and we say, Oh, this looks great. I'd love to buy this for my balcony. Wouldn't it be really cool to have our keys in this little nice and cute cupboard? Yes, darling, it looks fabulous. Please look what it's made of, <laughs> and if it's certified, FSC, Forest Stewardship Council certified, or not. Otherwise, we will, without knowing, contribute to this. And I don't blame him. 
course. Nobody can blame him, really. It's a job. He gets food on the table. Bauxite mining is another thing, also a heavy issue. Desi Ratnasari up, up right there, top right, she is a, a scientist and she's monitoring illegal concessions. Basically, there are legal concessions, but then they bribe people to let them grow sort of in all directions so they can mine more. And she's going around with a GPS to monitor what's illegal and what's not. A lot of these people receive death threats. Some people even disappear because it's a lot of money in this. And this is the oil palm. So here we go. We have lowland forest here and peat swamp, and then this is oil palm. And when you fly over it, it looks green. I, I've met a lot of tourists, a lot of visitors that say, isn't it beautiful and green here? It, it might be beautiful, but it's not a jungle. And it goes on and on and on. And what needs to be done is to find ways to obviously be able to grow palm oil, but in a sustainable way. So this is one of the major issues right now in that part of the world. But when we import eco-fuel, partly made from oil palm, we are also contributing to this. So we have to ask for the right product. If we're all you know, allergic to nuts, we would definitely look you know, at the package of the product we're buying so we won't suffocate one nice day. But when it comes to environmental products and, and the environment and sustainability, I, I don't think we really look. It's hard to be a consumer. What can I buy? What can I do in my life without screwing up a place somewhere? It's not easy, but, but I think we have to start a process where I think we already started a process where we care and where we think we can make a difference. And six and a half billion people, we are bound to be able to make a difference, both politically and as consumers. This is a farmer harvesting oil palm fruits. This is another great guy. These are pretty heavy and spiny fruits. It's a hard, hard work to harvest them but it's very profitable. Not for them, <laughs> but for the owner of the plantation. This guy is very fit. And I remember when I came to Borneo first, the first years when I went, I, I looked almost like this. <laughs> I don't know what happened to me. There are so many species that obviously suffer from this. We can't even count them. I mean, there, there's numerous species, but one that we, get attached to because of their intelligence and because they're both funny and sweet and, and fascinating, obviously, are the orangutans. And these orangutans get caught, you know, when you log huge areas and you have sometimes then islands of forest in the middle of these huge areas, lots of, of animals get caught. A lot of them burn or ju just, you know, go up in smoke. But those are survival then end up in these, on these islands. And what happens then is that female orangutans with babies, they will then venture out into these wastelands or into these plantations when they run out of food. And then the mothers are usually killed because uh, plantation workers or you know, log logging people will then find them and kill the mother and try to take the baby because you can sell baby orangutans. And this is illegal, but it's also understandable. You can, you can actually earn a lot of money. When they club the mother or hit her or, or you know, slay her with a machete or shoot, most of the babies are, die too. A lot of them that are captured and then kept as pets contract human diseases and infections. So there are projects in Borneo and in Sumatra, where also you can find orangutans, where they save orangutans and they, they create orphanages. So part of my assignment, most recent assignment, was try to, to visualize this. When we are small, human beings, from one, from, from one year to three, we have a certain way of we have a certain concept of life, basically. We, we, we see things and remember things in a special way. Orangutans, they 
are more mature. Their brains can handle information and memory and emotions better actually than we can in that age between those years, which is both frightening and fascinating at the same time, which means that baby orangutans that witness their, when they can see their mother being killed in front of them, remembers this and becomes completely traumatized by it. They have this strong memory of this. So it takes them time to trust people. This is a male that is put to, to uh, anesthetized to so they can treat him against some diseases that he has contracted in captivity, illegal captivity. This male was so afraid of the male veterinarian, so this female babysitter, they call them, she has to comfort him by holding his hand and, and caressing him gently so that this veterinarian can work. And it, it just takes time for them to trust men especially. Females, women, it's much easier. But even then, from the beginning, it's hard. And when people tell me, you know, a lot of people tell me animals don't have a soul. You know, to me, it's like saying the Holocaust didn't exist. Or it's like saying Borneo is fine. There's no logging in Borneo. It's like saying the glaciers aren't melting. Some things are just so stupid. And it gets to me. Here we have a baby orangutan. And look at the next frame. There's just certain, certain moments where you know, you just know that they feel so much that we, not, we can't explain. It's like looking at whales, like orcas, dolphins, or, or larger whales. We just don't know what they think, what their concept of life is. We don't understand. That doesn't mean that they don't think, of course. Again, I'm preaching to the choir, but it, you know, it, frust it gets so frustrated sometimes with these things. This, these babies are taking, they're, they're going to bed. But instead, <laughs> but instead of taking them one by one, they have so many. In this place, they have 500 orphaned orangutans. 500 without a mother, 500 that needs to be taught how to become an orangutan again. They don't know how to climb, really. They don't know what, what, to, what to eat. They don't know what to be afraid of. They don't know that a, that a snake, they should stay away from a snake. So the babysitters need to teach the orangutans how to become orangutans. And, and th that is a paradox, I think, that we, representing the worst carnivore, the worst predator, the worst enemy, will then be the ones that help them. But that is the wonderful thing about us, is that we can set things right. We can set things right if we want to. But we have to want to. <laughs> I will never forget this woman to the left. She was very, very sweet, very forthcoming, and very. she just loved the orangutans. And <laughs> it's so cute because she is in love with this orangutan, I'm sure. But the orangutan is even more in love with her. And she said, look at this. He loves when I do this to him. I do it every day. And then she started to tickle him, you know, in, in the face, as you can see. He's got this strange, huge tooth. Have you seen that? He looks so funny. And, and she laughed as much as he did. But then it's so cool, because right after this picture was taken, he looks at his orangutan friends like, Look, we have this special relationship. She's my girl, you know. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> it's like, you know, we have a thing here going. And then, but look when he looks back at her with love. You know, when you work with wild animals, wild orangutans, you obviously never get this kind of relationship. Of course, they're wild, they stay away from you. They can be curious sometimes, but they choose to stay away, which is wise. But as soon as you get this kind of relationship, which is to begin with not good, but at the same time, it is, it is very emotional. I think a lot of people, having met dolphins or orangutans or gorillas or you know whatever you can for a moment touch, 
with your hands or with your heart uh, and get really close to, that could be a memory for life. They can change you. I would like them to be wild. I would like them to stay away from me. And I cherish the moments when I've been covered up behind all these things, just waiting for the wild orangutans. And they have given me gifts from the forest when they come to me as wild individuals. And not to me, but they expose themselves so I can take pictures and film them. This is not the way it should be, even though it's, it's charming. But this is necessary. And again, this is a way for us to try to set things right. And a lot of people can now adopt these young primates and give them a better life. This is, again, something to ponder. We're six and a half billion people on the planet. Why should we care about an orangutan, for God's sakes? Two children per minute die from malaria. Does it matter if Borneo is wiped out and all its wildlife does it really matter if all the glaciers melt? Does it matter at all if we pollute the oceans? I think yes, because it's, the diagnosis is, is crystal clear that something is wrong. We're, we're handling our planet in a way that is not wise. My countryman, Carl Linnaeus, he, the guy who invented the system of taxonomy said 250 years ago that everything is connected. It's pretty smart. Nobody has said anything smarter for 250 years. I mean, it's really <laughs> smart. And that we need to understand. We need to be able to relate to these issues. We need to understand the importance of our daily choices and what we do, what we make of our lives. So when we lose the orangutans, when we, we can lose a number, we will lose a number of species. But it's like a pilot told me once, if you, you lose some parts of a plane in, the mid, in midair, you know, you, you fly this thing, and all of a sudden you hear this <laughs> sound, and you say, oh, that's something on the wing, what's, what's that? <laughs> it just fell off. Oh, we still fly. It didn't really matter, I think. <laughs> this seems okay. Yeah, Roger, Roger, this is great. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, yeah, this is fine, no problem. Okay. Oh, something is burning right here. Is this crucial? Is this important to... No, 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 it, it will be okay, I'm sure. <laughs> well, we're still flying. It works well. But eventually, as we, as we lose cards in this house of cards, the plane will crash, and that's what we're seeing. These are our, some of our cards that we have presented, that I have tried to show you in this house of cards. I just wish that when my kids, I have two boys, one is three, year old, three years old, his name is Einar, and one is seven years old, Ansgar. Two blonde boys with blue eyes. That when they grow up, when they're 15 or 20 or 25 and they go with their friends or girlfriends or whatever to Borneo or to Alaska or they go to Iceland or they go to the Great Barrier Reef and they want to take this giant stride out into this incredibly diverse and colorful realm, it, it should be there for them. I want them to be able to sit in a tree. I don't know if they would want to. I wanted to be able to sit in a tree in Borneo and listen to the gibbons. I'm afraid that they will not be able to. That's what I'm afraid of. And if nothing else, if we, if, if we can't find one other driving force to affect change, think of children and grandchildren and their children. What is the legacy? What do we want to leave for them? Now I want to end with a few pictures of my friends, the Penan. This is uh, one of the people's truest to the oldest of human lifestyles, hunter-gatherers in, in the more desolate parts of Borneo, still pretty desolate. But they're marked with sadness because they're losing their realm. Surprise, surprise. The man Tabaram, I'm working on a documentary on a man called Tabaram. Tabaram told me a story that was so 
strong while making poison darts like this. He's drying them here. They use a, a, a poison called tajem. It's sap from a tree that's very, very powerful and potent as a venom. He said that my grandfather showed my father the tajem tree. That it's essential, of course, for their entire life. I mean, that's how they hunt and get their food. And my father showed me the tree when I was ready for it. And I showed my children the tree. And then, after that, the machines arrived. And the tree is not there anymore. The thing is, the orangutans, they have advocates fighting for them. But when it comes to the Penan, they're not very successful. I think I'm a sort of a realistic optimist in a way, I think. But I'm not very optimistic when it comes to the Penan. I think they will lose their culture and their way of life, no doubt. And if they would be happy to do so, that would be fine. If they would say, you know, yeah, I am so sick and tired of eating this sago porridge. It's like wallpaper glue. Fine. But the thing is, some of these people don't. They want to have, the only thing they want is to have a patch of land where they belong. Have we seen it before? Yes, we have seen it before. But it's strangely sad how history has a tendency to repeat itself. This is my friend. When he's going for a walk to his neighboring tribesmen, the people that live in other nomadic settlements. He used to be able to walk in darkness. The people that walked in darkness, now they say that the sunlight gives them diseases and they die. It's not them. They, they don't get diseases from light. They get diseases from, from outside, of course, from new people coming in. So to me, this picture is very telling. This is a little group of nomadic Penan that travels on the roads made by loggers. Now this is the Borneo I want to give to my sons. This is the Borneo that I want you to be able to see, go to and enjoy. But in order for us to save Borneo, we need to give the people in Borneo a bright future. We need to demand products that are sustainable and we need to care. Thank you.